good, and your mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. It has been a week, has it not? I want to start in a different place this time. With the caveat that usually I come in on Sundays when I am going to preach and I have one exactly one thing to say. And that is not the case this week. Uh, so what I, I will maybe cover again some of the things I talked about at 8.30. But I have been thinking about violence in the world and the violence in our language. Um, when I was growing up, and also actually when my kids were growing up, and I don't know, you, some of you with younger people in your life, you can tell me if this is still true, but we did, we listened to fairy tales and Aesop's fables. And there was this story of the boy who cried wolf. Do you remember that story? Yes? Yes? So, that story talks about a shepherd boy who cries wolf, and then when there really is a wolf, what happens? No, nobody, nobody comes to his aid, and it does not go well for the sheep, right? That's a violent story. And that story, I think, speaks truth. And that truth does not have to do with whether or not a wolf actually ate a sheep. That's clear, right? <coughs> that t it tells the truth about what happens if your words cannot be trusted. Uh, and what that reality looks like. And Jesus' language in our gospel today, I think, trips people up. When Jesus talks about wheat, or he talks about pearls, or even sheep, I think we do a pretty good job keeping a certain distance, right? This is clearly a story. It's meant to convey information, but it's not conveying factual information about particular sheep, or particular pearls, or particular seeds. When Jesus uses a parable that features people and violence, we tend to be a little sometimes distressed uh, by that uh, because we lose track of the storytelling nature of what's happening in the text. Which is not to say that the text is not important. It is. It's just that it is operating in a space of this is what the kingdom as an emotional and spiritual reality is like. So that's one thing, right? It is not a question of an actual banquet. And you know this if you read it carefully and you do the timeline, right? Because first, the king in the story makes a feast. And then he goes and he wages battle. And then he comes back and invites a whole different group of people to that same feast, which presumably that whole time was sitting on the tables. Right, clearly not a factual story, but we still get lost in those details of why there is this language. The language 
is intended to get our attention, right? To speak with urgency about our invitation to be God's people. and not necessarily about a particular banquet that is waiting somewhere while this conversation is going on. Okay, so that's one thing. And then the second thing I want to name is that in the Episcopal Church, I would say that we are much more comfortable on the average with the idea that God extends the invitation to relationship with God wide and to all people, good or bad, then we are with the idea that there's any kind of consequence to our choices. Right? I am much more comfortable with descriptions of God that are loving and invitational than I am with descriptions of God that are loving and wrathful. Which is interesting, because when somebody talks about a mama bear, I'm a parent, and I totally understand what they're talking about. And I understand that combination of love, and fury, right? And I know if I see a bear cub in the wild to keep my distance, right? We know this, yes? We take seriously, right? So that language that invokes fury, that's meant to get our attention and cause us to take our choices seriously. Um, and not necessarily to take literally the violence of the language. Um, and so what we have in our text today in the gospel is the urgent invitation to be people of God. And then we have this gorgeous, gorgeous language in Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, talking about what that looks like. And Paul does this amazing thing. He wraps so many things into these uh, short paragraphs. Uh, this whole letter could be memorized, I think. Um, and, and especially some of the passages in today's. Uh, but he calls people to be of one mind in Christ. One mind in the Lord, right? And then he calls people to help each other to do that thing, right? So those are our two tasks, to be of one mind, centered on Christ, and to help each other to be of one mind, centered on Christ. At which point, if we're paying attention, we know that's because it's not easy. None of that is easy. And Paul says that we are to be known for our gentleness. Culturally, in the United States of America, that is a challenge, is it not? What does it mean to make our gentleness known? To be of one mind together, centering Christ and then letting everything else kind of take second place. What does that look like in our daily lives? What does it look like? And then to be in community, helping 
each other. I have been listening with dismay to the news out of Israel-Palestine this week. And also noted that early in the week was World Mental Health Day. And I want to acknowledge that before we even turn on the news in the morning, some of us are struggling. And call out that as a community, we are meant to be helping each other. We are meant to be being gentle. And I want to name that if for you it was a struggle to get out of the house this morning, but you made it. That you are loved and you matter. And if you are hearing me online, thank you for tuning in, for making the effort. And if you're not in a place where a big room full of people uh, will work for you, let us know if we can connect you in some other way. We have all kinds of opportunities, and I know that those can be hard to see if you're not talking to people in this room. But just let us know, and we will, we will help you get plugged in so that you are connected, so that we can be helping each other. Right? To do the things that Paul asks us to do, which are a whole list, and, and we've just talked about a few of those things. Um, because then the next thing is that the Lord is near. And so we are not to worry. Hmm. Simple words, right? Not an easy task to not worry. Uh, and it says, Paul says, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then the line we'd like next is, and then God will do those things for you. And it's not there. Right? We offer thanksgiving to God. We offer prayer and supplication. And the gift in that is peace. And letting go of the idea that we actually have the plan or the answers. Right? And, and, the peace of God which passes all understanding, right? Peace and joy as a matter of faith almost always defy logic. Uh, and, and, and really only come, I think, through prayer. This time last year, I was looking forward to a pilgrimage in the Holy Land. And... We got to speak with, or listen to mostly, uh, the Anglican Archbishop there. And he is the Archbishop for Christians in Israel, in Palestine, in Syria, in Jordan, right? So he has this huge geographical uh, oversight. Uh, and one of the things that he said was that it is really not helpful when people who don't live there offer vitriol and certainty. I don't think he used the word vitriol. But he talked about some of the vocabulary that internationally sometimes is applied to the situation on the ground, and he just said it doesn't help. Right? The people who are there on the ground 
have to live there, and they have to live there together. And our job is to pray for peace and to offer support to humanitarian efforts as we are able, right? Because, because Christians on the ground, among others, are in this place of trying to run schools and hospitals in the midst of terrible violence and suffering. So I commend those to you and... Um, and just this idea that I've been as I've been listening to the news, both in Canada and in the United States, we are evacuating people from there. So the decision making and the plan forward will need to come from the people who can't evacuate. Right? That's their home. And in humility, it, it really is not our place to have certainty. I heard a, a rabbi and an imam this week talking, and they made the point that there are people who will position this conflict as between Israelis and Palestinians. And really, it is a conflict between people who think the answer is violence and people who think there has to be another way. There has to be another way. So we pray for peace. Amen.